Why do you guys why do you guys love bourbon fishing so much? I love it honestly because of this guy. I mean to tell you our story, we met on the internet. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we really did. We met on social media and he invited me to go eel pop fishing and I really wasn't that interested in it. And uh, we went out in that first night, we got 21 at a time when you really shouldn't be catching eel yeah, pop. it was like, like January. Right. Yeah, right. And I had such a blast, I was hooked from that moment on, not on him, but on eel pop. <laughs> a little bit me. A little, no. <laughs> All eel pop. And I fell in love. My passion grew the first time I ever caught one. I caught like an eight pounder. It was the first eel pop I ever caught it was a giant. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that thing fought amazing. I need to go fish for these. And then I met Matt Brewer and I learned a ton from him. And then I just started exploring different lakes and the time of the year is, is perfect because it's warmer, like you can dress light. You're not freezing your buns off in January. I mean, you can, but that good bite is in February and March. And yeah, you get to fish outside. Well, and even all year long, all season long, all winter long, you don't have to go early. Like you can, you can go home from work, you can get some things done and then you can go. Right. It's you, like the working person's perfect, you know, fishing excursion. Right. You don't have to be there that half hour before sun, sunset like you do for that, that evening walleye bite. Or crappie bite. Right, you can just, you can work till 5, 5.30 and then go out fishing. All night. Right. You can fish all night. First off, any time that you can go heel pup fishing, fishing it's right. a good time. And I think so many people focus on that, the spawn right. in the late ice season when it is a lot easier to catch them. But honestly, you can catch them not only all ice season long, but all year long. Right, right. And we've, we've explored like late, late season in the boat, and then early ice, December, January, February, March. My biggest eel pout came a week and a half after ice out in April out of the boat. Um, I got to be with. And, and screw I got to net it and, and screw, screw up, up the, the picture. picture. Um, <laughs> but obviously, you know, the, the most fun is catching a lot of fish and you're gonna catch a lot of fish in early March when they're spawning. That's when you're gonna catch those 30, 40 fish nights. When it's really hard to go home. Yeah. A lot of times I've gone out and be like, I'm gonna catch 30 fish tonight, then I'm going home. I catch 30, it's only 11. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm gonna catch 40 and then I'm gonna go home. <laughs> well, I think location is is somewhat dependent on the time of the year. Or even the lake. Depths for sure, I've noticed. Yeah. The different lakes, fish act, act different. I guess typically my, my depth range is, I usually start at about 30 feet. Is usually what I'm looking at. It's a good, it's a good average number, right. I would say. Right. But you, I'm looking for sharp breaks. I'm looking for what are they feeding on, which is typically crayfish. You know, so you want to have some rocks nearby, or even rocks in that area that you're fishing in. Um, a lot of times, access to deep water. Right. Yeah. Near, and then nearby access. And then, as you near spawn, you're looking for spawning areas, of course. And you're either fishing on the edges of those, or right, right up and shallow if they're if they're going. Usually rock or gravel, or, uh, rubble, right? Rubble, <laughs> gravel. Some, sometimes, sometimes even um, kind of muddy bottoms. Mm -hmm. But it's typically again something near deep water, and I guess the the spawning areas that I I think I've found are, are typically in that nine, ten feet out to to deepest fifteen, sixteen. But you'll also find fish that aren't currently spawning just outside of it too, in, in that staging area. Right. And that might still extend out into that like 30 foot range. Right. I think you should present things. <laughs> present. Especially bait. Presenting Lures. bait is important. Yeah. With uh, hooks. As far as presentation goes, you can't, I don't think you can go too big. I totally agree. Some of the stuff I've seen sticking out of throats and bourbon will amaze you. We had a buddy that got a 34-inch uh, eel pout that had a 17-inch trout still in its throat, not not even digest, like the tail was still in it. I mean, we pulled it out, right? and it still took a bait. That's crazy. 
But I mean, that's like you eating a like four foot sub and just once. swallowing it whole. Right, right, and then eating afterwards. Right, <laughs> eating but, like some cake. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I think the secret's out that glow is key. Glow is um, essential. That's something that I, especially at night, you know, you get you do get a day bite a little bit during spawn, but at night, glow is key. One ounce, ounce and a half I've used. Um, and sound. Pet rattles. Rattles are they, nice. They help out a lot of vibration with, you know, any type of spin or anything like that. But we don't always do that. And I've had a lot of luck with uh, with scent. Even mm -hmm. I've even used a big nasty spoon and just put crayfish scent on it. And when they're biting, that will work. Even some of these scents that are made for saltwater fishing that just, I mean, more, more than anything, they just stink. Right. <laughs> Garlic bloody tuna is one I bought, and I don't think I'll ever oh, buy that Oh man, again. you spilled that in my truck. Mm -hmm, sorry. <laughs> I think I th I think Rod. <laughs> Rod. <laughs> I usually use Rod, but no, I think Rod. You just spit all over me. <laughs> well, I'm, in, I'm excited right now. I don't usually hand mine. I'm gonna be energy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Rod. Um, my rod choice, I love fishing outside and I'm standing up, so I prefer a long rod. I mean, I've got the Commander that I use is 38 inch inches long, and now I'm using, I've been using my lake trout rod a lot for these burbs, and you know, that's 44, 48, 48 inches. And I don't go quite that long. You know, I, I use the Clam Pro series. Um, it's actually a rod um, for, for big walleyes. I mean, it's a stiff rod. Um, but the nice thing is length. I mean, you can use a long rod because you're not worried about fishing in a one person shelter where you're gonna hit the wall every time you set the hook. And it's not like your sight fishing, pan fishing have to be right over the hole. Mm -hmm. You can kind of relax. And I mean, with that longer rod, you get uh, a better hook set. Mm -hmm. And I like that, that fiberglass on, the, on my lake trout rod has a lot of play in it. Because if you've ever fought a big burb, it's your rod is does this the whole time, right? And I prefer to use braid with a with a leader, so I don't have a ton of stretch going on in my line. So I need that rod to have that action to keep them keep them buttoned. And a lot of times I'll use braid or or like nanofill, um, and and I don't always put on a fluorocarbon leader. Sometimes I go direct right to the lure, but a, a swivel, a swivel is really important. It's, yeah, they get line twist bad, and I typically will run a a floral or even a mono leader, something heavy on the bottom just because that's what I do. And I think everybody has everybody has their own thing, but I don't I've never met a burbot that's been line shy. No. You can get away with a, a heavier Probably line. You, you really you really don't need to finesse them. Right. Well I would say the first thing and probably a really easy way to go about it is to talk to your local DNR office, the fisheries office, and they're going to point you in the right direction to lakes that actually have You'll pout. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't catch burbot in a lake that doesn't have them. Right. Um, you can go on their lake finder feature, um, but that takes a little bit more work to actually talk to a physical person is a lot easier. You can also go just your, like just to, just like you and I met. Right. You go, go to your local local bait shop. Go on the internet. The internet. I call me. I I talked to a guy for 15 minutes about burbot that yeah. had the wrong number. Um, <laughs> And I think one thing that I also do is you bait shops and find like the old local fishermen. Yeah. Because those guys have been on the ice for years and they'll tell you, oh, on blah, blah, blah lake, 20 years ago, we used to catch those eel pot all the time, throw them on the ice. Yeah. And then, but nobody's out there fishing for them because nobody has cared and there's still bourbon in all those lakes. And now people are starting to care. Like, and absolutely. it's really cool to see. Super it. cool. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of lakes, even just around Bemidji, that I know have yopow in, that I've gone out and played on and, and tried to catch them and, and haven't yet. So there's a lot of work to be done for, for me to get. There is a lot of work to be done for <laughs> To do some more exploring. You know, every, every fish species is important and has a place in the ecosystem. And not to mention, it's fun for somebody to catch. So, you know, treat it with respect. And talking about that, it's delicious. They are delicious to eat, but right now, you know, for instance, in Minnesota, there's no limit on them, and which is really unfortunate. Right. 
because there's a lot of people that take way more than they could ever eat. And in all honesty, eel pelt really isn't that good after it's been frozen. Yeah, I, I never, ever, I, well, I didn't say never. Uh, once, I froze it once and I just, it wasn't the same as it no. was fresh. Um, and I think, I think they're an important food source too for other fish. I mean, eel pelt are this big at some time. Something's eating them. I mean, we're up in Manitoba right now catching lake trout that I know for a fact are- <laughs> We know this spend, for a fact. <laughs> spend their time eating some meal pellets. So, you know, not only that, they're also, they're part of the food chain and they're, they're eating stuff and helping control populations and stuff's eating them. It's all about balance. <laughs> they love crayfish. They love crayfish a lot. Clay, crayfish and fish. I mean, that's pretty much right. what they're gonna eat. Right, I've seen, I mean, I've, I've talked to a bunch of guys about this and they're, they've always asked me, have you ever caught a suspended eel pout? And I said, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, quite often I have. And they're like, what are they doing? And I said, my guess is they're up there chasing like those, those cisco, those tulabies. You'll put an aggressive predator. They got powerful tails, they can swim, and they, they've got great scent. Think about that, Not like night. three quarters of their body is fin, and their mouths are huge. They're like top of the food chain, really. Right, yeah, especially when they get that 10, 12 pounds. They're, they, oh yeah. They're eating 17 inch rainbow. They're eating what they want to. Right. I'm, I'm good when you're good. Yeah, me too. Okay, you go first. <laughs> oh, when I'm good? <laughs> oh. You really don't want to keep the biggest ones. You wouldn't keep a 30 inch walleye to eat because it's got more meat. Right. You know, you want those smaller fish. Uh, you want to put the big ones back, obviously they're producing more eggs, but how would you prepare them to eat? There's a number of ways. Probably the most popular would be boiling. Boil it. Yeah. Boil it, boil it and se seven up or a different kind of soda. Or even uh, just water. Dip it in melted butter, yeah. Salt and, a little salt and pepper, it's heavenly. It's the only freshwater cod in the entire wor yeah, so world. The, that meat's real firm. I've done, uh, works really good, par cook some bacon, skewer it, wrap the, the chunks in, in bacon and, and throw it on the grill. That was not terrible at all. I, um, I did uh, eel pot linguine, that was fantastic. Eel, did, uh, uh, fish tacos. Yep, fish tacos. Yeah. Uh, we've done, uh, you know, lobster mac and cheese. We did the poor man's oh, lobster yeah. mac and cheese. Uh, Pat that's, Olson and I did that once. That's that was really good. That was neat. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, shoot, you can bread them and fry them like you do any other fish. That's my least favorite way of having it, but, right. but you can if you want to. Mm -hmm. I've spent some time in in Ontario and Lake of the Woods chasing them too, north of the border up in that Kenora area. And the biggest thing I've noticed, you know, like Shield Lake versus Bemidji area fish. I mean, it's just, it's kind of the location. And also you look at a lake like Lake of the Woods. It's gigantic. Okay, um, you know, throw a dart at the map and there's five really good eel pout spots. Um, so it's it's been a struggle trying to get up there and target, but I was able to narrow that down by by using some of the tools we talked about is social media, networking with guys up there and them talking to other guys and getting some spots and some ideas on where to start and doing some exploring. But uh, I mean, all in all, they're still they're still burbot doing burbot stuff. It's 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 a depth thing that's kind of changed. And, and, and just finding the, finding the spots. The presentation hasn't changed at all. Mm -hmm. But the, the one thing I've noticed being up here in Northwest Manitoba is just the average size. Oh my gosh. Is impressive, yeah, <laughs> my it's... goodness. You don't, we haven't caught a small one. We have not caught a small eel pout. And we've caught, I don't know, hundreds? Right. We've caught hundreds of eel pout up here. And the average is really impressive. The biggest we've caught this trip 15 and a half. 15 and a half pounds. It was ridiculous. You know, I think the smallest one I've caught so far on this trip has been four, five. I caught a 21 incher, yeah. but that's the only one. Right, yeah, four or five pounds. The first one I caught was 31 inches. Which is a master angler master up here. Master angler, three and a half minutes I, into the I trip. don't know how many master angler eel pout we've caught up here this trip. I think I'm at four it's, myself. It's incredible. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I guess my my burbot cadence 
if I'm standing there, I want the bottom about right here. And I give it a rip and, and a completely slack free fall line. And it's, it's rip, rip, and just let that bait hit the bottom and pound. And then I'll do a, a rip, pound, and then a slow lift up two, three, four feet, see if anything chases, and then go back to pounding. And then cadence can kind of change on how the fish end up biting. Because a lot of times you'll just be pounding, the bait will hit the bottom, you'll go to lift, and there'll be a fish on. If that's what the fish are doing, then I'm nonstop pounding, just because that's the bite. That's what they want. They're just going to come and grab it and lift it up. And I noticed sometimes when you were talking about the lift that you were shaking it like this mm -hmm. and just giving that bait more action. Sometimes what I'll do as I'm pounding it too is I'll stop and I'll just let it sit on the bottom for several seconds. And sometimes on your sonar, you'll see the bottom start to move a little bit and you know that there's a fish there and then I'll start to shake it up or I'll just slowly, slowly lift it and you'll feel the weight of that fish on there and that's your cue to set the hook. But the other thing that we do, we both do, and it's the, the easiest, laziest way to eel pout fish is we'll reel our line up like two and a half, three feet and just suspend it there and not even move it. You can put it in a rod holder and you just watch and all of a sudden a fish will just come up from the bottom and take it. That's where the glow is essential when it's, you're dead sticking like that though. And I would say- And bait. And bait, <laughs> but the, yeah, the stink, the glow, all of it. Yep. Well, we've had nights where that's the only thing they would hit. And I've experienced bites where the only time they would eat is if you're just shaking the bait on the bottom. Yeah. You're not even jigging. You just basically just shake it right on the bottom and they come and scarf it off the bottom. Yeah. It's, it's it, a very nightly, nightly change. They'll, they'll bite a little bit different each time you're out, really. Got a lot of experience using the big nasty spoon with those trebles and they work great for hooking fish. The issue is if you're like in a spawn bite and you're catching 30, 40 fish a night is, is getting those hooks out. But I've really liked, now Adam's making that pout pounder, that big one ounce jig with that same really, really good glow paint that he uses. And you've got a single hook and it's- Really easy to take them off. Yeah, a lot faster, I can get back down. My 30 fish a night can turn into a 40 fish a night. And up here in Northwest Manitoba, it's barbless. It's all barbless. Oh, yeah. And, you know, having done that, you know, numerous times up here, mm -hmm. now we push our barbs down when we eel pout fish. Because really, really for eel pout, you, you don't, don't need a you barb. You don't need that barb. No. They're, when they chomp down on that bait, they've got it. So a lot of times with those suspended fish, I don't ever fish up in the column. But it'll be one of those things where if that mark comes in up high, I'm always really up to it, just in case, and why not? Um, and then a lot of times too, if, if they're finicky, I mean, I've pulled burbot 10, 12, 15 feet off the bottom before, before I've gotten to eat. They just keep chasing, keep chasing. And you pretty much keep going. And if you, if, if you keep going, a lot of times they're gonna swim faster and take the bait. If you stop, a lot of times they'll stop too and just trail off. Mm -hmm. Or swim past it and disappear. Right. But two, if you if you hook one and you get it part way up the hole and you lose it, don't just throw a tantrum and walk off and stomp your feet. Get back down there right away. I mean, there's there have been times where I've had an eel pout hooked two or even three times and lost it as, as I'm fighting it and I've dropped down and it's bit again. Right, yeah, absolutely. They're that's very aggressive. Numerous times that's happened to me too. I just don't miss that many. <laughs> that was a good one, man. Well, typically, like, now we're using cut meat, which if, if I could catch a whitefish or a cisco at home yeah. and use belly meat, I would 100% because it stays on so nice. Up here, it's, it's legal. You can use fish parts for bait, but back home, yeah. you yeah. can't do it. So then we're going down to the local bait shop and typically getting shiner mouse. Golden shiners, yeah. are, typically, if I can find those, that's my favorite. And I'll put put the head on one hook, pinch off it halfway, and throw the tail on the other, on one of the other hooks, and or you, the same hook if it's And when you single. put the tail on, it's best if you hook it in the tail because that, that meat back there is really, really stiff, so it stays on the hook well. But, you know, when we get to the late season, 
when when the eel pout are spawning and they're most active. When you go to the bait shop, it's really hard to get shiners because yeah, you, you know walleye season's closed and a lot of the shops don't stock them. So you know fat heads, they'll do sometimes a rogue leftover sucker minnow. Right. Any 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 minnow I can get my hands on. Any minnow. Right. It's just I like the shiners because I think they got a little more scent. They're letting those scales off when you're jigging. Yeah. And they work. And they work. Use what works. Are there any plans to uh, do a, a two-man bourbon bath next time around? Both you guys in there? No. <laughs> I've seen his swimming shorts. No. no. <laughs> How's your guys' back feel right about that? My back's fine. Uh, it's your great. Knees are My knees good. are. It's no, it's we're really good. Yeah, really good. More stuff just to after all this, after all this fishing for for these days that has been awesome, and how many hook sets and how many holes drilled, and well, you haven't drilled any holes, but I haven't. I know. I, I know this. <laughs> I, I know this. I think it depends on your level of confidence with the area. If I go back to somewhere where I know I've caught eel pout in the past at a particular time of year, or maybe it was just a couple days ago, I'm probably going to spend more time in a single hole mm -hmm. um, because I'm figuring that they're there. Um, I would say I spend more time in a hole fishing for eel pout than I would say for, for pan fish. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've got the general area, you just need to refine it a little bit. But, you know, I, I would definitely move. I'm not gonna drill one hole and stay there all night and go, well, they didn't bite tonight. Right. And if, if I'm in a new lake or a new spot, uh, what I'll like to do is, you know, like I said, we're always looking for, typically it's a sharp break. I'll try to pop a hole in, you know, like I said, I like to start in 30, but I'll pop a hole in 25, 20, and then 35, 40 and fish each of those holes. And typically what I've seen is you fish an area, one night they might be biting in 30. That's the track they're running that night. And the next night you go out there, you fish 30 and you don't get a bite, you pop that 25 foot hole and all of a sudden now you're catching them. And it, I think it's real night dependent on the, kind of what depth they're, they're working that particular night. But that's the progression. I like to just, that 20 to 40 foot is, is where I always typically will drill those holes and start and look. The other thing is, it's very rare that somebody would go out and eel pout fish by themselves. It's a very social sport. It's almost, it almost has a cult following now. Right. And uh, you know, it's very common for a group of anglers to go out together and work together to find out exactly what depth they're in, where they're moving, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so you can so cover that. It's a social sport. You get four or five guys, you can cover that 20 to 40 feet real fast narrow it down like we need to be fishing 28 feet and spread out on that that 28 foot break my my experience with the daytime bite is is somewhat limited um, but i do know that the day bite coincides with the spawn um, from everything i've i've learned in talking to other bourbon anglers um, seems like it lasts like seven to ten days which the spawn lasts seven to ten days and and I don't know the ins and outs and why they do it but it's almost like they completely flip they bite during the day during the spawn and then don't bite as well at night during the spawn I would agree with that there are times though you know outside of the spawn where you can go midday and catch some fish but you're not gonna catch as many as you would when you hit that you know, even just right before dark. It doesn't have right. to be necessarily after dark, but in that, that twilight period. Mm -hmm. oh. I've never had to, ouch. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh. We're just gonna take a breather oh. here for a second. That's how bad my knees are. They were legit on their knees for probably like four minutes. I legit back, knees, can't stand. Neck. What? Thought it was a burb. What did he say? <laughs> Holy Dinah? This... I think Dinah means dinosaur. <laughs>